Three I've seen it twice today. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's my good luck, right? I'm a better tractor, right? Good <laughs> deal. Excuse me, Senator. How are you, sir? Uh, We're being joined by a former Attorney General. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All Democrats, yeah. thank yeah. God. <laughs> and I should introduce the Ambassador. The Earth 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 is back there, so say hello, Earth Earth. Hi, Neil. Good to see you. Come sit down, Neil. Sit right here. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm saying that you know, like, there's a concern about Medicaid redetermination and the uh, debt ceiling agreement. That would there be enough funding? And I know with both of you there, I have a lot of confidence that it will be there to make sure that folks who are eligible for Medicaid and Medicare funding will be protected with this debt ceiling agreement. So the president did a really good job protecting uh, Medicaid. Um, and our, our whole caucus was obviously behind that. But the next challenge, one of the next challenges, maybe the biggest challenge uh, on Medicaid will be making sure that we're doing everything possible to do the outreach to the folks who could lose Medicaid after the public health emergency ended. I just read a column in the Washington Post from a couple of days ago that said that already, uh, since about, I forget the date in April, but in less than two months, about a month and a half, half a million Americans have lost Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And half of those, roughly half of the half a million, lost it because of paperwork issues or you know, a, a mom working two jobs, raising a family, misses the deadline, or all kinds of um, frustrations that uh, could result in a lot more than half a million losing it. So we've got to make sure that every possible American, especially children, have have Medicaid. And it's, it's going to be mostly up to the states, and, and I know Governor Pritzker, Pritzker and as well as Governor Shapiro in Pennsylvania, both clients of Salt Shore, by the way. <laughs> uh, I know they're doing a lot of outreach, and HHS is doing outreach, but we got to do our own part to make sure that people know that they have to, they have to make sure that they're uh, enrolled. Um, not everyone will remain eligible, but for those who are eligible. By one estimate, there's 70, it's around 70% of children who, um, who, who could be affected by this, uh, could lose Medicaid eligibility because of that, this redetermination that you made reference. I want to add one footnote to this, and that is uh, give you a name to remember, LaShonda Young. LaShonda Young. She was chosen by President Biden, along with Steve Rochetti, his lifelong uh, staffer and loyal to him, to do the negotiation. Shonda is, handles the budget out of the White House, African-American woman, who worked in the U.S. House of Representatives for years handling the budget. Let me tell you, she was our secret weapon. Mm -hmm. She went into that negotiation, and she knew this backwards and forwards, and the other side did not. They had a handful of slogans I mean, that's about all they had to offer. And she just so um, was so amazing the way she crafted the Democratic response. Now, the reason you, you might have seen her name, but the reason you haven't heard more is that this president and his followers are kind of uh, basically ignoring the basic rule of politics. I first learned when I was a kid in the first political campaign that humility is the first casualty in politics. But when it came to this effort, uh, humility has been the watchword. And the belief has been, at the start, by the Biden people, we're not going to say a damn thing until they pass it in the House and the Senate. We're going to have it. And I think at this point, Biden, who handled this as well as anybody could have handled it, uh, now believes that he has the Republicans on the back feet. This was supposed to be the big play, shut down the economy or take our way. Uh, and he managed to avoid shutdown and, and, and conversely came up with, with Medicaid this idea of working if you're on food stamps, you know, what, what she managed to accomplish was to extend the working age requirement from 49 to 54, but then on the back door to open up all the opportunities for the, the food stamps and the SNAP benefits to uh, veterans, homeless, and children coming off foster care. And that result, more people on SNAP benefits now than before the negotiation. She did that over and over again, so if I sound like I'm starstruck, I am. In this business, I've seen a lot of people come and go. 
she ruled the day in that negotiation, and that's why it came out so well. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. Sure. Current recipients of Medicare um, seems to be a little unaware about the whole redetermination process. Uh, we've utilized, I'm at University of Illinois Hospital and Physicians Group, mm -hmm. and of course we do a, a lot of uh, business with that, that population. But we've found through our care coordination efforts, just making them aware yeah. right, that you're, you are going to have to, you know, yeah. to return, re re determine your, mm -hmm. your eligibility. And we can't rely on just HFS um, to give that message because we're the ones that actually have the day-to-day -day yeah. with those patients. And I don't know how much of that is happening throughout the healthcare industry. Those who, those patients, those members are currently assigned to their ability to outreach and just give that, what, watch for this date, you know, this is coming. Give that reminder. And I'll tell you, Emily, what I'm hearing back from my care coordinators is when they're having these initial discussions, it's not on anyone's radar. It's not on the recipient's radar. And that's what we need to, to do, get it actually on there in the front of their brain. Yeah, we should work with institutions yeah. in the healthcare sector. Because you're seeing I'm a geriatrician. I'm uh, at University of Chicago, and um, I saw that you were on um, aging committee. And I don't know if you're. Um, it would be very nice for uh, to have more robust, expanding programs for older adults. Um, as long as I've been in field of geriatrics, I actually came into geriatrics thinking I was going to change healthcare policy the way it's written for older adults. And uh, many years later, it's actually sh the space for older adults is shrinking. Programs for older adults are shrinking. So it would be, it's a request to really keep it in your radar. No, As right. we are getting there ourselves, we need to have better programs yep. to support them in the community. Well, a couple of things we could do, and, and some that we're, we're all doing as a caucus already. One is to make sure that the Older Americans Act gets funded well when it's up for reauthorization. Mm -hmm. We're working on that. Secondly, is just uh, to protect Medicare. Yes. Um, you know, a lot of people think, oh, it's off the table, in the, it was off the table in the debate between or the eventual negotiation with the White House, but it's never off the table with these extreme <coughs> Republicans. They have proposed year after year, budget after budget after budget, where they go after first and foremost Medicaid, because they don't accept Medicaid as, as something that's necessary. But even Medicare, which is a, an earned benefit, they want to chop it down over time. I mean, you've, you've seen them, they tried to voucherize it one year, they try to cut it the next, sometimes they try to do both. So just protecting the existing Medicare program, not to mention Medicaid, just protecting them from cuts is almost a full-time job with these extreme Republicans. Because they always think that a government program is the enemy. Always. Mm -hmm. That's the first rule um, with, with extreme Republicans. Um, thirdly, I think what we should do, it's something we tried to do and build back better, and we should keep a focus on this as, as we should on other parts of build back better, is to provide more opportunities for home-based care, absolutely, which is essential. And which, by the way, if the Republicans don't join us at some point over the next 10 years or so, uh, their own constituents are going to run right over them. Yeah. They want it. Republicans want this at home. Mm -hmm. Democrats want it. Independents want it. Right-wingers, left-wingers, middle of the road, I don't care where you are. People want to get their skilled care at home. They don't want, in the great country we have, the only option to be a nursing home. Even that, people can't afford. Uh, right. You only you have to be on Medicaid to be in a nursing home. Well, we should we should find more money, f more funding for Medicaid. And you know Absolutely. where we can find it? We can find it in the tax code. If the money's there in the tax code, if you're if you're willing to say to wealthy people and big corporations, you're not getting a break this year. We're gonna we're gonna try to provide funding for Medicaid. So the good news is, I think in our caucus, we're doing a lot of what you've suggested. Um, but on a lot of days, it's hard to, to get the votes we need to, to move it forward. There you go. So 
about like 10, 20 years ago, bipartisanship was much more closer than what it is today because of uh, radicalization. And so the thing is that when are we going to unite America again? Because it's starting to divide between two sides and two parties. And instead, we need to have an America where we can do bipartisanship equally and easier. And so the thing is that uh, when are we going to start becoming closer together as America rather than Republican and Democrat, rather as American people? And yeah. And one more question after that. <laughs> well, I have some thoughts, but I need to yield to my senior colleague. <laughs> I have some thoughts about it. You see this? Yeah. Everybody's got one, right? Mm -hmm. So do your kids, don't they? Yeah. And your grandkids. And you wonder what the hell they're doing. Mm -hmm. Why they're on the phone all day, mm -hmm. looking into social media, and what impact it's having on their life. So I'm chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and we decided to have a hearing. And what came out of that hearing was scary, frightening child sexual abuse on this little mm -hmm. contraption here can haunt a person for a lifetime and lead to their suicide. The other things that are going through here are just outrageous. So you say to yourself, Senators, why don't you do something about it? So the Senate Judiciary Committee, I'm getting to your question, the Senate Judiciary Committee said, we're going to do for the first time in 20 years, establish standards where they can be sued for what they put on the internet. They can be sued for it, held personally accountable. For what happens and we looked at I brought in the drug enforcement agencies it turns out that we are facing the scandalous plague epidemic of fentanyl and what's happening with that when you hear someone has passed away and you say wait a minute I didn't know they were sick and they're too young I wonder what happened too many times it's some copycat drug that they ordered on the internet that had fentanyl in it and it killed them so we put together five bills on the subject all of them bipartisan bills in the Senate Judiciary Committee. If you took a look at that Senate Judiciary Committee and know anything about the Senate, you'd be amazed that we could agree on anything, anything. You know who's on the Democratic side, you may know who's on the Republican side. All of these bills passed unanimously, all five bills, and I'm pressing Chuck Schumer, bring him to the floor. The point I'm getting to is there's room for agreement, and we've got to look for that opportunity, and I think this is something that the parents and grandparents across America would say is the highest priority. So don't give up. And second question, uh, easy question. Let me just add to that just quickly. Oh. I think there's evidence with what Chairman Durbin said about his committee. There's lots of evidence just in one committee. And then in addition to that, if you consider the infrastructure bill, mm -hmm. the chips and science bill, uh, the, the bipartisan gun bill, which no one talks about, which made small but incremental steps forward. Um, I'm trying to think of some others. The budget, bill. the budget bill, even this even this debt agreement. To, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean they, they a, a president who put a priority on bipartisanship, working with Democratic leaders, but then every once in a while Republicans joining. So I think there's significant, in fact, you can make an argument as divided as we, as we are, there's been more major operative word being major, more major bipartisan legislation in two years than there's been in 10 years mm -hmm. or 20 years. But it's not enough. I think that's a sure thing. We've done, we've done pretty well, need to do a lot more. But here's why I'm confident about the future, your generation. Uh, your generation, you know, climate change for your generation, it's not a Democrat-Republican issue, it's the whole generation. Your, your, your generation's not gonna stand for someone saying climate change isn't real, climate change is important don't need to do anything about it. Your generation is going to lead that. And I'm confident that that's going to happen. I'm not trying to absolve my generation of responsibility. we got to do, do our job now. But I think there's more of it out there than people realize. But we are a very much tribal society. And we've never been pulled apart as much as we are. But I think there's some evidence to the contrary that we can get some things done. You had another one. Yeah, easy question. He came to an event earlier to, for us today. Are we warm up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> easy question. Um, when are you two going to retire so I can take over? Take <laughs> oh, my God. Well, here's the good oh my news. God. The founding fathers in their infinite wisdom said you have to be 30 years old to run for the Senate. Are you 30 yet? Hopefully. Uh, <laughs> 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 How about uh, one more question? And let me see. Uh, Aaron. Sure. 
Um, so this is sort of a related question, but with a forward-looking focus, too. Um, we know that the state of civics education in this country has declined significantly over time. I have to believe that that's part of the root of the divisiveness we're experiencing now, that there's sort of a fundamental misunderstanding of how to engage effectively and productively with political institutions. So I'd appreciate you addressing that, but also in light of the fact that we're coming up on America's 250th anniversary celebration. And um, so I'd like you to project out on what you're hoping 2027 looks like in this country. Well, first of all, the best uh, 2026 celebration is going to be in Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> we have some assets, the Declaration, places you know places where those documents were forged. No, but um, again, I'm very confident that your generation is going to be able to to move us further down the field, frankly, than mine has, even though we've done some good things. Um, but I, I do think that there's a there is a there is a a gap in um, that kind of engagement that gets people involved civically, but it just if you just even use the word politically or or governmentally, people don't um, don't engage as much. They feel it's a foreign territory for them. They don't want to don't want to be part of it, or they don't they don't take the time to, to learn about it. Um, I think the solution to that is it uh, would, would take a while to, to kind of itemize what we should do. Um, but we have to, I, I just think we have to reach young people, even before they become young people, when they're children, to somehow engage them so that they, they're aware of what, um, what's required of citizenship, what, what, uh, what government action is about, what political action is about. But I, again, I, I am amazed. I have four daughters, and you know, from late, mid to late 20s into the 30s, and the, the degree of engagement by young people in politics today is nothing I've seen in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Even even more more engagement than the Vietnam generation because it's so broad based. It's not just anti war yeah. or, or the comparable scenario to anti war. It's climate change, it's justice issues, it's yeah. issues that involve vulnerable people. It's such a wide range of issues that I think uh, your, your generation is moving us. This gun bill we did last summer, a bipartisan bill that no one no one on the planet predicted would get done. No one. Yeah. And it got done because of your generation, mostly after Parkland, just demanding that we do something that is measurable and, and uh, significant. And I think we did it. There's more to do. Obviously, there's nowhere near the, the work that should be done on background checks and on banning military style weapons and all that, mm -hmm. assault weapons. But and Dick's been working on these issues for longer than I have. But I do think that your generation has already proven its its uh, ability to get things done by pushing us. That's I'll make three quick points. I always describe myself as a liberal arts lawyer. And it's my excuse for not understanding things I should understand about math and science, <laughs> just knowing this much, yeah. learning about the liberal arts education. But I really grew the day when liberal arts is no longer offered or Fewer people are using that as a platform for the rest of their lives. I think that kind of education really teaches you how to learn, and it opens up the experiences of the world to you. So uh, I'd start there saying I you know, regret that that's heading that direction. The second thing is technological, AI, yeah. artificial intelligence. My fear, and we're just starting to come to understand what it is and what's involved in it, my fear is that this is going to be a rema remaking of the human experience mm -hmm. uh, and some of it with a lot of deception that will be part of it as well. Uh, and I worry about the impact that's going to have when people are going to insist something is true because that's what they heard over and over on the internet. Yeah. And the third point I want to make is political, I'll just be as political as I have to be. This notion about burning and banning books about critical race theory, mm -hmm. yeah, to you. me that reminds me of the days when the Soviet Union decided that any chapter in history that didn't treat them well could be rewritten for the people of Russia. Mm -hmm. And this notion of whatever the hell woke is, this notion that everything has to be attacked because it's just too much woke this and woke that, to, in my mind, is dangerous as hell. I, I am a Senate Judiciary Committee, I have, I'm not going to say who, but one of the Republican senators said, 
she could not give it away. She could not uh, support a man who wanted to be a U.S. attorney because he actually said that he thought our country had experienced systemic racism. And you think to yourself, what in the hell books have you been reading? Of course we've gone through yeah. and we're still no, going yeah. through. And, you know, yeah. and so this denial uh, when it comes to teaching and such, it worries me. Yeah. Uh, and I think we ought to speak out against it. You know, I do believe in a liberal education. Mm -hmm. I believe that people ought to be able to make their own decisions based on the facts. Aaron's doing exactly those things as a leader of the Lincoln Foundation here. Uh, doing great things for Abraham Lincoln and keeping his legacy. Oh. And Omar, you had one more question. It's, it's going to be short. It's more of a comment, you know, in this, in switching gears to foreign policy. You know, I understand that Pakistan is an evolving democracy. And recently, some 65 uh, congressmen wrote a letter to Secretary of State. Uh, you, are you aware of the letter and the content? I don't think I saw it. No. Just to let you know that yeah. we have a counter narrative. I represent the Association of Pakistani Positions of uh, mm -hmm. for Justice and Democracy. I right. shall be submitting a rebuttal to that. So just that you're aware, there's, there's uh, this side. Uh, but tell me about the letter. What's the content of it? The content is about the current situation, that uh, there, there have been gross uh, human right violations. Right, right. Um, although we do not believe that, we believe it's part of a politi political process. The country mm -hmm. is going through it. It's all happening by the law, but the things are going to improve once uh, they allowed the political process to move on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the letter will be self-explanatory. Okay. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. Thank you, Dr.